Hey everyone, before I get into this video, I want to remind you we are giving away a $99 Nintendo Switch eShop gift card to enter head down to the description or the pinned comment. So I wanted to have a deeper discussion on why Nintendo can get away with selling games, whether they are ports, remakes, or remasters, at $60 a pop. Now they don't always do this, and people have correctly corrected me, the Wind Waker HD, Twilight Princess HD, released on Wii U at $50, which to me, it's close enough to $60 to not care, but it's also interesting they did that when they probably could have got away with a $60 price point back then as well. But we know that Nintendo's been doing this a ton on Switch. You don't have to look far to see a $60 price point across the board for pretty much every Wii U port, every remake, every remaster that Nintendo controls and owns. And a lot of people are kind of upset about Skyward Sword HD. One, it is $10 more expensive than the prior Zelda HD efforts. Two, it doesn't look that great when you think about the fact that uh, Super Mario Galaxy, also a Wii game, got the same sort of HD treatment, the same sort of controller remapping, and was sold at $60, bucks, but packaged with two other Mario games. So it really makes the value of Skyward Sword HD seem like Nintendo is massively overvaluing it and screwing over consumers. But why? Why can Nintendo get away with this? And you want to know how we know Nintendo's getting away with this? We did a video earlier where the sales are just soaring right now for Skyward Sword HD. You want to know how crazy the sales are? For a brief moment today, for about a 25-minute period, Skyward Sword HD was sold out on Amazon. Sold out. They had to literally publicly say something about it, and they got a hold of Nintendo to procure more copies for pre-sale. It's probably going to end up selling out again because of that. Skyward Sword HD is in very high demand. Maybe the highest demand pre-ordered Zelda game of all time. Not necessarily surprising if you look at how it comes off of the massive sales of Breath of the Wild. And if we think the sales of this are crazy, wait until pre-sales happen and uh, we, we get some real data behind Breath of the Wild 2 whenever we're allowed to finally pre-order that game. So, yeah, Nintendo not only is getting away with the $60 price point, they are massively benefiting from that. But why can they do this? Why can Nintendo get away with it? Why are consumers okay with it? Well, first we'll talk about Skyward Sword HD on its own. And then I want to get into a deeper conversation on why it's almost not fair to compare what Nintendo does with their pricing to what other companies have done, like the Ratchet and Clank reboot back in 2016, or even, uh, you know, the, the Crash Insane trilogy or whatever. Let's talk about this. Uh, first, by quoting myself, I'm actually going to read a couple posts I made of, on a forum uh, called NeoGAF. Uh, I don't really post there that often, but there was an interesting conversation going on. So I decided to uh, get in on this because some people were saying how the game doesn't look very good. And I'm not going to talk about that so much because that's just a subjective viewpoint on art direction and, and all that jazz. But I want to get into the, the thought process that Nintendo's trying to take advantage of people by saying, hey, they're charging you 60 bucks to rebuy nostalgia. So here is why I had to say about that. It's time to have an honest talk about this. Skyward Sword came out on the Wii a decade ago. Zelda at that time had peaked with Twilight Princess before it at around 8 million in sales. It came out at a time after the next generation system, Wii U, was announced. So the Wii was already dead, and the idea of motion control Zelda really fell by the wayside as it came about two years too late to catch on to that motion control Wii fad. This led to the game only selling 3.5 million units. Keep in mind, at this point, Skyward Sword was the most expensive Zelda game ever made, yet it instantly became the worst selling 3D Zelda, you know, traditional 3D Zelda, ever released due to the poor release timing for what it was trying to accomplish. Fast forward to 2021, and we have had a major Zelda game come out since in Breath of the Wild. A popular franchise in Zelda just became mega popular practically overnight. Breath of the Wild expanded the Zelda fan base massively, over doubling the previous best-selling entry in the series. This has thus brought in an entirely new, massive 
audience to Zelda, an audience that probably, for the most part, doesn't own a Wii or a Wii U, and thus they have no other way to experience Skyward Sword. Nor was Skyward Sword likely even on the radar as a Zelda game at that time. A lot of focus is often put on the value of games at $60. It's just an emulation style up res, right? It's just remap controls, right? To those of us that played the original, sure, I suppose. I mean, technically it also doubles the frame rate, but still. With only 3.5 million of us actually existing that played the original, let's say all 3.5 million of those people ended up buying Breath of the Wild. That leaves roughly 17 to 18 million additional Zelda fans today who haven't. So while Nintendo is properly advertising it as a blast from the past, with A.G. Onomo telling people directly this is not going to play like Breath of the Wild, to a majority of people buying this, it's literally their first time ever experiencing this game. So the question isn't so much, is it worth $60 to people who have already played it? The question is, if it's worth $60 to those of which this is basically a brand new game for them. This is often overlooked in conversations over pricing of old games or ports of $60. Because the majority of the time, people buying these games are spending $60 because for them, it is literally a brand new game as far as they are concerned. This brings the question up of perceived value, but reality is if it was worth $60, no issues as a brand new experience back in 2011, to people under which this is basically like Nintendo releasing a brand new major Zelda game for the first time, is it worth $60 to them? Obviously, we can tell with Amazon sales alone, the answer is absolutely. This game is likely going to outsell the Wii version day one. Heck, it may even become a 10 million seller, instantly becoming the second best-selling Zelda game of all time. Reality is, most of us look at this under the guise of paying extra for nostalgia, but literally, a majority of sales for this game are going to go to first-timers. Now, this just deals with Skyward Sword HD, but I actually went into a deeper conversation on uh, the prospect of Nintendo selling games at 60 bucks. Because a lot of counter arguments come out there about other companies that have done more and sold games for less, you know, 40 bucks versus 60 on the original. So there's a grander conversation that other companies respect their fans more, put in more work, and give us games for cheaper. And frankly, you're probably not wrong. I mean, people can bring up Ratchet and Clank back in 2016, uh, but that's just one of many. However, most of the time, not all the time, but most, these examples are frankly far less valuable IP. As an example, that Ratchet & Clank 2016 game, it's like the second best-selling Ratchet & Clank game ever. Yet, it didn't outsell Skyward Sword on the Wii, the worst-selling 3D Zelda game ever released. This should put things in perspective. Did they charge $40 because they were trying to give people a good deal? Or did they charge $40 because Ratchet & Clank is simply not a very popular series? And thus, trying to charge $60 at that time for a remake of a game that also didn't sell that well seemed absolutely ridiculous. Okay, fine. What about Shadow of the Colossus HD? $40. It was cheaper than the PlayStation 2 launch price. Oh, you mean an HD version of a game that barely cracked $1 million in sales the first time around? Do you not see a trend here? If these companies thought they could remake and remaster games and charge you $60, they would. They don't, because they understand the value of these IPs is already not really that high. I'll give you a polar opposite example, a game that is popular from a franchise that is massive. Final Fantasy VII. They put such an incredible amount of work into the remake, but in actuality, you are fundamentally going to be spending more to get the complete experience or over the original release. They know they can get away with it because Final Fantasy and Final Fantasy VII was that big of a deal and that big of a seller back in the day. They gave you part of the game right now for $60. You might get the rest of the game later for another $60, assuming that they do, you know, actually give you all the game in that $60 package. They could do a part three. Who knows? Is the game worth at least $120 for many? Absolutely. But that's actually a price hike not a price cut. Now, there is no debate about the amount of work that goes into a remake versus a simple HD port, uh, which, by the way, HD ports were very common back in the PlayStation 3 and 360 days. Uh, so naturally, it's easy to argue that even part of Final Fantasy VII Remake at $60 is potentially a better value than Skyward Sword at $60. But that's not the point. It got remade. Just like other games that got remade that originally were $60, but came back and sold at $40 on the remake. They didn't even give you the complete Final Fantasy VII game, and they still charged you $60.
why didn't they launch it at 40? Especially knowing they were going to have to have a second part. Because Final Fantasy is a very valuable IP. They know they can charge $60 and sell a crap load. So I think before we start comparing effort and launch prices and how Nintendo is relatively lazy, we need to first examine the actual value of the IP we're talking about. Is Skyward Sword HD basically the same thing they did with Mario Galaxy, which was packed in with two other games? <laughs> Absolutely. Is it far lazier than so many other HD jobs and remakes and remasters who then decide to release at $40? Yeah, you're not wrong. But most of those comparisons are for IP that simply put, they're not really that valuable and couldn't get away with a $60 price tag. The ones that can do charge that much. Don't pretend because these other companies are like your friend because they're charging you less. They don't charge $60 because they can't. Nintendo does because they can. Because the games and IP they're doing this with are extremely valuable and in high demand. Hello, Skyward Sword HD, literally selling out on Amazon. So, yes, Skyward Sword HD is quote unquote lazy. It's quote unquote overpriced. But for those who played it already, eh. Yet, it's still more valuable than basically any brand new third party AAA game landing on Switch this year really this side of monster hunter rise and that's really the fundamental part of this is it not nintendo gets away with these 60 dollars price points consistently because the ip they're doing it with is so much more valuable than all of the comparisons i have heard tons of games brought up and you know what i don't hear i don't hear people mentioning those games aren't very popular Zelda is more popular than it's ever been. They can re-release the Wind Waker HD for $10 more than they did on Wii U, and it's going to outsell the Wii U version and the original release back on GameCube. Same thing for Twilight Princess HD. It might outsell the Wii version of the game that sold over $8 million. What we need to understand here is Nintendo gets away with a $60 price point because they acutely understand the value their IP has. Why do you think they know they could sell you those classic systems, the Ness and SNES Classic? Why do you think they know they could put their games behind a uh, paywall and, and do this Nintendo Switch Online service stuff? Why do you think they were able to make you rebuy games for premium pricing at times, $20 a pop for some N N64 games on Virtual Console over and over and over again? Because Nintendo knows they're IP is valuable, and as long as Nintendo treats their IP as valuable, it's consistently going to hold a high price. Breath of the Wild today has yet to be reduced officially at retail. Sure, you can find $45 copies on Amazon and other retailers that are just trying to you know shoot stock out, which notably the prices aren't that way during the holidays typically, but uh, technically the MSRP has not changed. It is still being sold today. Four plus years later, you know, almost four plus years later anyways, at $60. Why? Because Nintendo understands the value of their IP. We could talk about Evergreen. We could talk about continued sales and how Skyward Sword still sells in the top 20 worldwide every single month and all that jazz. We, we can go into all the particulars about how Nintendo gets away with that pricing. But reality is Nintendo has consistently treated their IP as high value. So if Nintendo holds their IP at a high value, it creates the expectation from consumers to equally hold Nintendo's IP at high value. In addition to the fact that many of these IP in comparison Comparison to the other games brought up that did more and charged less simply frankly aren't as big of a deal if it couldn't get away with $60 they would have sold significantly less copies because the game's not that popular in the first place the interest level isn't very high that new Ratchet and Clank coming out looks fantastic I you know I, I can't wait to play it on PlayStation 5 but it's not going to outsell Skyward Sword HD Skyward Sword HD is going to outsell that game by miles. And yet, it's a brand new Ratchet & Clank game. It, more effort. It's worth 60 bucks, But it's not as valuable as Skyward Sword HD. And then we're talking about the worst-selling 3D Zelda ever. So, why does Nintendo charge 60 bucks? Not because we're all suckers, right? You know, you could say, you're a sucker, right? There's too many suckers out there. Well, for starters, Skyward Sword HD... Again, went over it. First time experience for many people. It's like a brand new Zelda game to them. Two, well, frankly, Nintendo holds their IP at a, at a high value, causing consumers to hold it at a high value. We're not suckers for holding games at the same value that Nintendo does. 
If anything, other companies wish they could go back in time and do exactly what Nintendo has done. If you think these other companies are your friends? No. They can't get away with what Nintendo does because they don't value their games that way. When you go and you see, I don't know, let, let, what's the next major game coming? I guess Ratchet and Clank on PlayStation 5 might be the next major one. Or you see Halo Infinite come out or the next Call of Duty or whatever, right? Like, maybe it's a new Last of Us game or something, right? We just said Last of Us, you know, 2 or whatever, Part 2. Okay, so those games come out. Guess how long the companies keep the value at $60? A month? Sometimes only a couple weeks. I've seen $60 games reduced to 40 to 30 in a week sometimes. Why? Because the companies undervalue their products. And when they undervalue their products, the consumer undervalues their products. There is a consumer expectation to wait to buy games sometimes because the prices are going to drop. And that's beneficial, right? Makes games cheaper. But it's also happening because these companies have undervalued what they have. Okay? Nintendo consistently for 30 years has not undervalued their IP and they've created the expectation that we should value it at the same level they do. You don't have to value it the same level they do. You absolutely can just not buy it and you're not wrong for, for doing so. You're right to critique Nintendo for not doing more. There's nothing wrong with the critique. This isn't a, this isn't telling you to accept what Nintendo's doing, but it's telling you why they do it, why they get away with it, and why other companies actually honestly wish they could pull off what Nintendo's doing. But since they haven't done it consistently, they've consistently created expectations for low prices, for honestly more work, which actually leads to less money for developers and crunch and all this crazy crap that shouldn't happen in this industry. In the end, we're left with Nintendo understanding the value of their IP and holding it to it no matter what. If you are a Nintendo fan, you know you're not gonna buy a port, a remake, a remaster, or a brand new game from Nintendo, typically at anything less than $60. It happens on rare occasion. The Wind Waker HD, Hello Princess HD, Captain Toad released at $40. Bucks. Donkey Kong Tropical Freeze was $40 bucks originally on uh, um, Wii U. I know it was $60 on here. They actually increased the price. But here's the thing. Nintendo knows the value of its IP. And they're going to keep it that high. Because as long as they do, consumers are going to continue to value it that high as well. The moment Nintendo starts to do what the rest of the industry does is the moment Nintendo can't get away with what they're doing. So why would Nintendo budge? They shouldn't. If I was Nintendo, they're just doing their best job to make as much money as possible at all times while keeping consumer expectation on the value of their IP at an all-time high. Let me tell you, Sony, Microsoft, Activision, EA, uh, 2K, all these companies out there wish they could keep their IP valued so highly. But they can't. Not even Grand Theft Auto V, which is what, 80 million plus in sales? Jesus. Like just a behemoth. I mean, what? Wii Sports is like the only thing up there that was a packing game. Okay? So 80 million plus. Well, I mean, Minecraft's up there too. But you know what I mean. 80 million plus there. Uh, you see, you know, things like Red Dead Redemption 2 selling like crazy, right? But they undervalue their game so quickly, so quickly that it creates consumers' expectations that, hey, when Skyrim comes to the next platform, when GTA 5 is ported over, you know, fully with a next-gen update, we want that for free or we want it for like 20 bucks. Why? Because they created the expectation. Nintendo doesn't play by anyone else's rules, which is why Nintendo consistently is the most successful company in the video game industry. They really are. Think about it like this. They've been doing video game stuff for over 35 years, 40 years to be exact, right? Starting with Donkey Kong. 40 plus years Nintendo has been doing video games. In those 40 years, they only have two years ever where they didn't make money, where they did not make a profit, where they actually posted net losses. Two years. You know how many times it's happened for EA in the last 40 years? <laughs> if they've even been around that long? Well, just one quick look up shows seven times. How many times has it happened for Sony? Oh man, 14 times. How many times has it happened for Microsoft? Well, a bit harder to judge there because you have to separate out video game revenue from the rest, but it's happened four times that I can count. These companies wish they had the success Nintendo does, but they don't. It's not to say they're not successful in their own right, but Nintendo does their own thing. And frankly, it's okay for you not to be okay with it, but Nintendo's not going to change. No matter how many people boycott and don't buy Pokemon Sword and Shield, enough people are going to buy it to keep it going. Nintendo has created expectations, and they keep 
well, consistently sticking to those expectations. All right, folks. I am Nintendo Robojets from Nintendo Prime. Let me know what you think about this down in the comments below. Again, you don't have to be okay with what Nintendo's doing. Be critical. I've been critical. But at the end of the day, they're just doing what they always do, which creates higher expectations from us of the things they do make that are brand new. Which I think I can fairly say on Switch, they've kind of lived up to that, right? Odyssey was great, Breath of the Wild was great, Splatoon 2 was pretty good, Splatoon 3 is looking even better. Like, Nintendo's creating high expectations for their new games because of what they do. As long as they keep delivering on those expectations, for the most part, they're going to be just fine. Alright folks, I'll catch you in the next video.